Welcome everybody to Cutting Edge of Food Waste, Tips and Tricks on Reducing Food Waste. My name is David Burley and I'm a coordinator with the Waste Aware Project. I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And I'm joined by my colleague Sheila Chohan, who is the Education and Communications and Outreach Manager at Veolia UK, one of the largest uh, uh, environmental and waste management companies in Europe and indeed the world and and my other colleague Andrew Wakeford who's head of the West Hearts Food Academy and also head of hospitality at West Hearts College. Um, we're going to we're, we're, get, we're going to get underway very shortly but just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, we have time for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, it would help us to prepare for the Q&A if people who have questions can type them in the chat uh, and we will then try and answer as many of them as possible. Any that we're not able to, uh, to, to answer, um, either because we don't have time or because, uh, because we need to uh, uh, research into them, uh, we will respond to as part of our feedback to all participants. So please use the chat for any uh, questions that you might have and we'll look forward to uh, addressing those in the Q&A session after the presentations. Right, well I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit, uh, Helena, if we can go on to the um, Hertfordshire Waste Partnership slide. That's brilliant. So uh, I mentioned that uh, there are three parties to this uh, to this particular presentation and the, the, the organisation I represent is Hertfordshire Waste Aware, which is the campaigning uh, initiative of the Hertfordshire Waste Partnership. All 11 Hertfordshire local authorities working together as they have been since 1992 uh, to reduce waste, promote recycling, uh, encourage reuse and reductions in waste. Um, an initiative that brings together waste services for over a million household, a million residents in Hertfordshire. Um, and uh, our mission very much chimes in with the, with the, with what we're going to hear about today, which is looking at ways of reducing waste. And in this particular instance, looking at ways of reducing food waste. If, if we could have the next one, please, Helena. And our partners in delivering this initiative today are uh, Veolia UK and West Hearts College. Um, as I mentioned, Veolia are a world leader in environmental solutions. They work with local municipalities, local councils, they work with wastewater companies, they work with commercial organisations to promote essentially the circular economy, finding new uses for waste materials, helping, uh, helping local authorities, helping residents, helping commercial organisations reduce their waste. And uh, Sheila uh, has very considerable expertise in this field. Uh, 20 years as a waste management professional, which has included time at Decorum Council, where she was a very uh, active and enthusiastic uh, member of the Hertfordshire Waste Partnership. She's also worked in London local authorities before joining Veolia, where her, her responsibilities include working with local residents, businesses and schools to uh, ensure that as much waste as possible is recycled and that we focus on reducing waste. And uh, Veolia have a waste management contract with Watford Council and, they, and within Hertfordshire they also work in St Albans. Um, I'm going to explore a little bit more about our other partner, West Hertfordshire College, uh, when I speak to Andrew Wakeford well, while he does his live uh, cookery demonstration a little bit later in the presentation. But I'll just confine myself to saying that West Hearts College offers a, a range of um, career orientated uh, catering and uh, hospitality courses at from degree level through to HNDs and apprenticeships. Uh, and as I say, I'll be exploring more uh, about that with uh, Andrew uh, later on in the presentation. So the next. So I think that's it by way of introduction. I'm going to hand back to my colleague Sheila now, uh, and she'll guide you through the through the afternoon. Thank you, Thank Sheila. you David, for the um, introduction. So hello, everybody, and welcome. And it's so lovely to see um, so many 
uh, participants on on this um, on this um, chat actually, and and also um, thank you so much for the opportunity, Suspest, for um, put, putting this on and actually giving us the opportunity to um, to to uh, to add our own input here. So Andrew Wakeford and I will be talking to you about how Beaudi and West Hots College colleges young trainee chefs how they join forces to create a Love Your Leftovers cookbook to help reduce food waste, which contributes to climate change. So this is what's um, coming up in our taster menu, pun intended. So we'll talk about um, food waste and climate change and the relationship, relationship between the two. We'll talk about the Love Your Leftovers cookbook, how the collaboration actually happened. There'll be some wonderful live recipe demonstrations, which are coming straight out of the actual cookbook itself. So Andrew is actually in the kitchen right now, cooking this up. Um, and also there'll be a, a student led um, recipe demonstration as well, which has been pre-recorded. And rather than just hearing from us all the time, there's gonna be a chance, an interactive session where we want to actually hear from you via our chat facility. And I'll be talking through uh, a little kind of workshop called the journey of a banana. And then lastly, how we can empower you to be a food waste champion and how you can become food savvy and kitchen savvy to help you reduce food waste and also save a bit of money and save the planet as well, because we all want to do that, don't we? So the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw said that there is no sincerer love than the love of food. But yet, as a planet, we are wasting so much food. And I'm going to display here some of the shocking statistics, which really hit me in the core. And I'd like to share that with you. So I just want to give you a little kind of map out as to what we're facing here. So over a third of the food produced globally goes to waste. Now this weighs around 1.3 billion tons and the cost is $3 trillion. I mean, that's a huge amount. Also in the UK, um, the average family throws away 22% of their average um, weekly shop, which is worth about £730 per year. So just to give that, um, just to kind of scale that up and, 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 and give that away so you can actually understand that. So imagine you have four, four bags of shopping, food, bags of food, and one out of those four bags, you may as well just throw in the bin because that's what that is. 22% of the weekly shop will just go into the bin. Also, all of the world's nearly 1 billion hungry people could be fed on less than a quarter of the food that is wasted in the US, UK and Europe. So really we have an ethical issue here as well that it's, it's wrong to be wasting this food when you've got so many hungry people out there. Now, if um, food waste was a country, it would be the third, third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and the USA. When I was putting together these statistics, that one really hit me hard. Um, it was just quite mind blowing to, to read that. And also an area larger than China is used to grow food that is never eaten. And lastly, reducing food waste is actually the number one solution to the climate crisis, coming above even electric cars, solar pan panels and plant-based diets. So, you know, I'm hoping that these statistics here will now um, give you an overview as to what the issue is. And, you know, when I speak about climate change and um, people will say like, you know, how can one person make a difference? Well, we can all take climate action and this is something that we can do in our homes by actually, by actually um, avoiding food wastage. In that way, we can avoid um, contributing to climate change. So the collaboration between Veolia in Watford and West Hearts College, I'm going to explain how that actually came about. So just to give you a bit of a, a, bit, of, a, a bit of background, we only introduced a new food waste collection service in, in Watford, and it was to capture the inedible and reduce and reuse the edible. So it's a fact that in the UK, households waste about 6.5 million tonnes of food every year. Now, 4.5 million of that is edible. So um, this works out to be about eight meals per household each week. So the edible of things that we're talking about is actually 
the last few bites of your meal that you can't quite manage, you know, those bread crusts that just don't like to eat. All of those things equate to eight meals per household each week is what we're throwing away. And that's actually responsible for 14 million tons of carbon dioxide alone. And that greenhouse gas is equivalent to flying from London to Perth more than 4.5 million times. So we only had the idea to work with young chefs to deliver the, to deliver the message and be a force for change, for them to be a force for change in their lives, in their chosen career as chefs, and also to their local communities. So this cookbook is not just a cookbook. It's not an ordering cookbook. It's a plant-based um, Love Your Leftovers cookbook. If you can move over to the next slide, Helena, thank you. It's a plant-based Love Your Leftovers cookbook to address the gro growing global problem of food waste and its contribution to climate change. It's packed with ideas and how to waste less food to save money and cook the most tantalizing dishes that will give your bendy carrots a new lease of life. Um, and it also explains about the impact of food waste on the environment related to climate change and the benefits of not wasting food and buying local, organic and in season. So we pitched this idea to um, West Hearts College and also gave them like a bit of a global outlook that by doing this cookbook, we'll be meeting three of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, as you can see here on the screen. So Veolia um, delivered two workshops on food waste and climate change. And this was me last year talking to the, um, I think it was level um, level one and two um, chefs. So they're 18 to 19 year olds. Um, and, you know, we explained about this kind of relationship between food waste and climate change. And these 18 to 19 year olds have chosen a career as chefs. And we only wanted to empower them to think about how they can be the ones that can bring on, on, on the change. So with the inform information that Viola provided, um, Andrew worked with 12 of his student chefs to create recipes from the most thrown away foods. So just to give you an idea of what the th most thrown away foods are, it is um, creating recipes from the most wasted food. So if we can just have the next slide, please. So just this gives you a snapshot of the most wasted foods. So we can see here that every day in the UK, we throw away 20 million whole slices of bread, 2.7 million carrots, bananas are getting wasted left, right and centre because they might have a little bit of black mark on it, but inside it could be just lush. Um, you can just see here, and you know, I want you to reflect on a moment or two, are these any food types that you've actually thrown away? You know, are these vegetables that you may have thrown away? I've put the word tricky there for rice because Sometimes people cook too much rice and they don't want to eat it again because of various reasons. But um, as long as you, it's best to keep rice in the fridge for at least one day. But when you do actually reheat it, it does need to be reheated thoroughly. And then it is actually can be edible as well. So Veolia, um, once the cookbook was actually finalized, the, the book was sponsored by Veolia's Recycling Fund for Communities. And this fund supports grassroots projects that protect the environment and encourage people to do the right thing with their waste. So in Watford, we help students and the local community to reduce their food waste. And really, it was really impressive to see that these young chefs were writing up this cookbook, creating these recipes from the most thrown away foods during a lockdown last year. It was really impressive to work with them and really proud um, of Andrew uh, with the work that he's done with the chef. So um, since we actually funded this, um, this cookbook, we've actually revamped our funding. It's now called the Sustain Veolia Sustainability Fund. And we offer cash sponsorship, in-kind resources, staff and volunteers. And the project, and you can actually apply for these pro uh, your, your projects. If your projects, are, if you can show evidence that enhances biodiversity in your local community and promotes sustainable waste behaviors of reduce, reuse, recycle, and it protects sustainable um, resources and the environment, then um, we want to hear from you. We have over 60,000 worth of funding available and it's actually going to be launched from the 5th of, 5th of June, which is World Environment Day. So if you are part of a community group or if you're a school or an individual which has ideas, we would love to hear from you. 
And now we're going to move over to the kitchen because we have Andrew Wakeford there, our, um, our um, head of Food Academy. And he's going to be doing a live demonstration from our actual cookbook. And he's going to be um, cooking up mushroom stroganoff. So over to Andrew. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So today I am going to be uh, producing a mushroom stroganoff. Um, we're going to serve that with um, some braised rice. So um, my first job would be to take some shallots, which I've peeled, and I will finally chop these by my fingers. I'm going to use two of them, two halves. Andy, Dave, uh, Dave here. While you're while you're um, doing your wonderful shallot uh, uh, chopping, let me distract you by asking you first of all to tell us a little bit more about the West Hearts uh, Food Academy. How did it come about? Uh, uh, where is it? Okay, we're, we're based in Watford, in uh, the lovely new campus at the top of town. Um, we've been here for ten years, but previously we were in uh, Cassia College, which is a little bit further down Langley Road. Um, we offer um, school leavers the opportunity to learn professional chef skills uh, in large amounts. So we have about up to 100 every year. Um, and they, they do a three-tiered three course. So they do a level one, a level two, and a level three. Um, we also Sorry, offer... Uh, just to interrupt you, Andy, you're on the mushrooms now, yeah? I'm just slicing some mushrooms, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, you see them? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, we offer the three levels of chefs courses, and then we also offer um, for school leavers a two-year BTEC program, which is um, it's called hospitality and events management, which is kind of getting the front of house people for the future um, and trying to um, put the next sort of leaders of industry in terms of restaurant managers. Uh, the next Fred Syriax, in, in, in fact, essentially, Andy. Say that again, sorry? The, the next Fred Syriax, you're, you're changing. Oh, yes, possibly, the, yeah. You're yeah. changing the next celebrity. It might take a little bit longer, though. <laughs> okay, so I've just got a clove of garlic, which I'm going to uh, very thinly slice. And, uh, and Andy, is, is the um, West Hearts Food Academy exclusively for uh, students then, or, 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 or is there a kind of leisure, could, 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 could ordinary civilians uh, get on a course there? Yeah, um, all, of, all of our um, full-time courses are obviously cert certificated by City and Guilds or by Pearson's, but we do run um, some part-time pastry courses in the evenings, we run chocolate workshops, we run uh, leisure courses for adults, which could be anything from Italian cuisine, um, Chinese. Um, we're just about to start doing a, a, a vegan course, as well as also a Caribbean uh, course. I've got one of my lectures is the Caribbean, and he's an expert in that field. So we offer sort of a four or five week evening course, three hours an evening. Fantastic, um, uh, Andy. Can you just move? Yeah, brilliant. Um, one of our one of our viewers was struggling to see the chopping board because of the because it's strategic, strategically positioned chopped mushrooms, but you've just moved them. Just moved them, yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I've got my garlic, I've got my shallots. I've got just a little bit of thyme here to give us some flavours, which I'll put in with the shallot. And um, I have some smoked paprika, which you can use all the paprika, but I think the smoked gives us a good flavour. And I'm going to put the smoked paprika into a larger bowl. And I'm going to put the mushrooms into there and just work them around a little bit so that we're getting um, a bit of a covering all the way around. So this should give us a nice smoky reddish brown colour. Uh, a little bit of salt and some cracked black pepper. Then I also have on my tray some just any tin top chopped tomatoes and I have some um, coconut cream which would be what we use instead of cream. And finally, um, just a few uh, cornichons or gherkins, which gives it a little bit of um, acidity against the sweetness. So we're just going to 
thinly slice these on the angle, like this. And, uh, and Andy, um, Helen has just put on the chat uh, how, to, uh, how to get access to some of the part-time courses you were mentioning. But if, if people don't have the time to commit to a course, um, you've got a training restaurant there as well, haven't you? Is, is that open now? Is it reopened? Uh, how, 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 how can we find out about it? And what's the menu like? Okay, so we offer uh, three evenings a week, we offer dinner. And four, possibly five days a week, we offer lunch. Lunch would cost somewhere around um, six to eight pounds for two to three courses. And dinner starts from 12 to 15 pounds. But we do a lot of special events as well. So for instance, um, in the last four weeks of the term, which is two just gone and two coming, we've done uh, an event every night and quite a few of them for charities, including um, one where we did the menu from the book, which all the proceeds base go to the Random Cafe. But also we've done uh, a function for the Nodgorod Society, which is based in Watford. It's a friendship society with uh, Russian towns. We've done uh, an event for uh, dementia. We have our own dementia dining uh, area here where um, once a month we will have to make sure sufferers from the local community coming in and we give them a full lunch and some music and a little bit of activity. Um, and also we've done an Italian, we've done a Spanish and we've got a Caribbean coming up, which is going to be supporting the sickle cell. And the last day- I think, I think, you're, going to find, I think you're going to find your, your, your bookings are, are, um, are, going through, are going through the roof here. Uh, Helen has just put the, uh, the details on the chat. But uh, another person was asking uh, uh, Andy about the knives you're using. Are these sort of very sophisticated sabatiers? That are sort of fine these, these are, this one is actually a Smithfield. It's quite a big, heavy knife. Obviously, I've been a chef for 40 odd years, so um, my fingers are all um, Fairly, fairly safe, but we we, won't, we have a range of knives. Um, we do have some sabatier. Some of the students have them, but it's very much personal taste with knives. I think um, you have to make sure the handle fits your hand properly, so that when you're cutting, you 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 sort of feel comfortable. Otherwise, you can end up with blistered hands, which is not very pleasant when you're working all day. Okay, um, hope you can see my um, my wok is on now. In here, I've put the um, shallots. I'm just giving them a little bit of a, a start. And then I'm gonna put the mushrooms in the smoked paprika. There's no, no oil here then, uh, Andy. Is this just a little bit at the beginning, yeah. Not yeah. too much, because it makes things greasy. So, I'm turning the um, mushrooms over with the shallots. And, uh, and if you don't have a wok, Andy, at home, uh, you could do this in a in a just a sort of heavy bottom frying. Yeah, pan. just a just a, a flat sauce, a flat um, frying pan would be fine. Uh, Maybe you need to stir it a little bit more just to sort of stop it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's um, yeah. ideal with wok, but you can do it without with other things. So I'm now getting. You can't smell this at home. I don't think you've got uh, smell vision. Smell vision, but. Um, we're getting a lovely aroma from the, um, the smoked paprika. The next thing I'm going to do is I've got a little bit of um, brandy and some vinegar. Which I think I mixed them so I haven't got much of a long bag. You're, trying to do a, you're trying to do a Christmas pudding effect there, right, are you, uh, Andy? That's right, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do now. This is going to test the fire. Um, look at that. That is special, isn't it? Yeah, just a little bit of theatre. It's um, o o only only try this under supervision at home, everyone. That's right. We um, we only let the students do it under supervision. <laughs> okay, so the mushrooms are, are cooking away there. We've got quite a bit of juice in there from the uh, the brandy. So I'm going to let that reduce down a little bit further. And once that's happening, um, I have some uh, rice which I've raised here earlier. 
Um, the phrase dry sun in the oven, uh, ratio two to one of stock to um, rice. So uh, any vegetable one. stock for that there then, uh, Andy? No, this is vegetable stock, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's gluten free. So, so I'm going to just put this into a cup, which I have um, greased with a little bit of soft butter. And hopefully you'll see at the end, we'll have a nice, what we call in the industry, Sheila would know this one, a tambal. Delicious. So it's just, again, it's a little bit of presentation. Uh, you need to push it down a little bit so that it, it holds. And Andy, braising that rice in the, uh, in the stock, uh, how, how long would you do that for? Uh, 18 minutes. 18 minutes, that's very precise. Okay, folks. Yes. Timer on. So I put a little bit of tomato flavouring in here. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple spoonfuls of coconut milk. Oh, coconut great drink. ingredient. Oh, delicious. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> my mouth's watering. <laughs> Obviously, the coconut curry is really to taste. Um, you could put just a little bit in, or if you like the flavour, you could put quite a lot in. So, if you, uh, if, if you decant any you haven't used into a, into a ceramic bowl and uh, put a covering on it, it'll keep in the fridge for quite a while, won't it? Sam? Yes, it will, yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing you don't get, if you were doing uh, this with double cream, the the colour of the actual dish would be much um, lighter and creamier. But you don't get that so much with the coconut uh, cream. The, no, last the, the liquid in, tends to go that grey colour, doesn't it? Yes, Yes, a little bit. But it, 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 it still looks nice, but it's not quite the same as... Tastes uh, delicious. <laughs> Finally, I'm going to put my um, cornichons in. And, um, and uh, just on the sort of calorie side, Andy, um, coconut milk, you mentioned double cream as an alternative, which, which, is, the, uh, which is the least uh, um, challenging in terms of... Um... Well, this says uh, 18 grams of fat in a um, 425 can. Right. So just basically check, uh, check, on, your, check on your containers or... Yeah, it... It would be about. slightly more healthier than cream, but I would think a lot. Um, what you could use is some creme fraiche, um, but just be careful that you don't um, boil it again afterwards because it can split. Yeah. Excuse me. So I'm just going to have a taste. Oh, I wish we could taste it with you. Roll on taste vision, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's almost perfect. So, next thing I'm going to do is show you how to flat up later. Get me a big spoon. So, I'm going to turn my tambour upside down on my plate, like that. Hopefully. Oh, that Look at that. Oh, yes. That's a MasterChef prize winner, if ever I saw one. Very and impressive. Just carefully spoon your dog it off. Mmm. Wonderful colour. You've got some, you've got your, you've got your smoked paprika and your tomatoes giving it a lovely red. Then I've just got here some a um, little bit of parsley and some chives just to finish it off nicely. That is absolutely wonderful. So there we are. We could I think, get you'll, have a, to, I think um, you'll have to try it on our behalf, it. won't you, Andy? Sorry? <laughs> try it for us and tell us how delicious it is. <laughs> um, I've got Aaron here from marketing. I could get him to have a look and see what he thinks. I'd be more than happy to have a go. There you go, yeah, well. Yum. 
You should see what, that there. Look, looks lovely. Oh, look at that. Yes, it looks absolutely wonderful. It's a real presentation dish. Yes, great. Well, Andy, thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. Right. Yeah, no, that was uh, good. Uh, hopefully, you can all see everything that's going on. Um, it's uh, always a bit tricky when you're doing things live. It certainly is, but I think you, you handled it with, with a plum. You weren't put off by any of the questions. Uh, that's wonderful. And, you, and I see that you've got some of the cookbooks all alongside, and Helena has, Helena has uh, uh, yes. put up the chat. These are the cookbooks. Get a hold um, of them. And this yeah. is one of the recipes in it. And uh, the Fantastic. stroganoff is um, somewhere. I know it's here. Um, um, here. Among the many delicious recipes in the cookbook, you will find the stroganoff. So that's a really good reason to buy it. Yeah, I think I think there's some really good recipes. A lot of the ideas, well, pretty much all of the ideas came from the students, um, and they also created most of them. Um, there and we go. do you That's, know how many of how many of the cookbooks have been sold, Andy? Uh, I think we've sold about sixty-five um, so far, um, and just the proceeds are going to four of our charities. <laughs> so to um, dementia dining. Uh, to Reevely Lodge, which is in Bushy, to um, the P Polio Foundation, which used to be based in Watford, they just moved out of, a little bit further, and finally um, Medcap. And um, the they will all get. Sorry. sorry. I was going to say, isn't it the case that the cookbook's in line for uh, a major, a major prize? It is actually, yeah, we've been nominated. Um, I had an interesting uh, email from a chap called Edward Quantro, who is actually from the Quantro organization. And he runs um, a World Gourmet Cookbook Awards system. And uh, the, the, the show is actually happening in June in Paris. And we will be on show there. Uh, should we be successful, there will be an award ceremony in um, Paris in November. How wonderful. So we're keeping fingers crossed for that. Yes, how wonderful. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully uh, hear how we get on. That will be great. Okay, well, I think, I think that's probably bringing the demonstration to a close. I think, I think I'll, I can hand back to, uh, to Sheila now, I think, Thank, uh, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, Andy. Any other no, that's good. Thank you, David. Thanks for Thank watching, everyone. Much. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Back to you, Sheila. Thank you, Andy and David. I know what I'm going to be doing after this session. I'm going to be <laughs> yeah. running into the kitchen and <laughs> make myself a, a mushroom stroganoff. I was actually at um, West Hearts College's charity evenings last week, um, so they were raising money for Random Cafe, and I would wholly recommend um, for you guys to actually get yourself over there one evening and check out the food it's absolutely wonderful these young chefs are there in the kitchen actually making recipes from the actual cookbook itself and it's just a fantastic atmosphere so please do support um, West Hearts College on their uh, and their endeavours so now this part of the um, segment what I'd like to do now is actually to hear from you so I'd like to do this little um, workshop where we're calling this part a, the journey of the banana from land to hand. And I want you to think about the resources that it actually takes for a banana to travel from the land that it's grown in for it to then reach your hand in this country. So when a banana is thrown away unnecessarily, what resources are we throwing away too? So I want you to spend a few minutes now to have your input here in using the chat facility and um, we've got David or even Helena to to actually um, to actually um, view the 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 um, conversation that's happening so I'm not sure if we've got anything coming through so just to repeat that it's a journey from a banana it's a journey of a banana from the land that is grown when it reaches your hand, what kind of resources are actually being, yeah, so. Okay, we've got Helena kicking it off with, um, yeah, Ian, that's it, the people, transportation, Gail, thank you for that. 
Uh, Susan has mentioned uh, about shipping containers. And they're coming through thick and fast now. If there's any more. Labour, Catherine, thank you. Is there anything else that you can see there, David? Somebody's asking about banana skins in home composting, whether they, uh, uh, they, they can turn... Uh, they can turn a little bit archaeological, can't they, and remain quite a long time. But I don't know whether anybody saw um, Prue Leith's uh, Channel 4 programme about, um, about uh, avoiding food waste, which is on Tuesday evenings. It's about halfway through its run. But on the first show, which was a, a, a week and a half ago, um, there was a recipe for smoothies uh, using um, bananas, including the skins, and peanut uh, butter and I have a daily fruit smoothie and I've had the uh, the banana skin and peanut butter smoothie and it's absolutely delicious I had it several days ago and I'm still alive so uh, so I can confirm it tastes fantastic it's a great so if you're really concerned about using uh, banana skins um, check out uh, on all four um, Prue Leaf's uh, current um, food uh, leftover program. It's a good program anyway, but uh, particularly on uh, on bananas. Thank you, David. So I'm just going to read out a couple of um, comments in the chat facility. So we've got, um, yeah, we had, um, I'm just going to scroll up. So we have Helena kicking off with water um, and soil, which is right. Um, Ian Port has mentioned people. Obviously, to grow anything, we need people. Um, Gail has mentioned transportation. Definitely, there's, there's, as you can see on the road nowadays, there's a lot of lorries anyway. You know, um, transporting um, food items and, and anything really from one area to another, from a port to to the actual distribution site. And then we have, in port mentioned again, um, paying people properly, um, plastic for the bags. Catherine's mentioned storage as well um, that requires a lot of energy to actually freeze anything um, and then also and also men somebody mentioned actually Catherine my compost worms love banana skins there we go they've got quite an appetite and so then we have Susan mentioned something about I make overnight oats with bananas this is great maybe I can add the skin try it out and do let us know how that goes and um, yeah Helena's mentioned pesticides and fertilizers, definitely. Um, Gail said that she's once saw a huge mountain of bananas being thrown away at the food waste site. It was shocking. So really this exercise is to get you to start thinking about when you, when you buy something from the shop, it doesn't matter how much it is. Sometimes the value of it might think, you might think that if the value of it is, is low, you might think it's quite easy just to throw it away because it doesn't quite look right or it's not of the same uh, not the quite uh, the quality is not quite there but I really want you to think about the kind of types of um, resources that it takes that like all of the food and drink that we purchase has actually been grown by using resources such as land water labor energy manufacturing packaging transportation and it these things turns it into the products for human consumption. So when uneaten food is wasted, it's also a waste of resources. So let's just go through this. So can I have the next slide, please, Helena? So firstly, we need the land. For any, for any types of fruit or vegetables, we need land. And sometimes that land has to be cleared and it has to be make sure the land is fertile. So with that, we need water, whether from irrigation, spraying, pouring, or some other means. Water is essential to the growing, growing of agriculture, and not to mention the feed of, of animals that give us, whether it's um, um, dairy or meat. But in throwing out millions of tons of food, we also waste uncounted millions of gallons of water that was used to plant, grow, sustain, or otherwise produce it. So fruit and vegetables are among the most water laden food products simply because they contain more water. And here's a little um, fun fact for you. One bag of an, um, apples is about 81% water. But meat products are the heaviest water users simply because the animals drink a lot of water. And more importantly, because so much water is needed for the grain that becomes their feed. 
it takes about eight to 10 times more water to produce meat than grain. Secondly, it releases methane. When food is thrown out, it can sometimes make its way to landfill, which can themselves, themselves be a problem for the environment. As food begins to decompose or rot, it releases methane gas. Methane, of course, is a greenhouse gas, which um, we believe that it adversely affects the Earth's climate and temperature. Um, it's very effective at trapping heat in the atmosphere, more so than carbon dioxide, about 20 times, 25 times more effective. So um, much of the methane, as well as other adversely affected gases, have already been released in the production process. So the wasted food is now adding to it. Now let's move on to waste, resource, waste of resources. Food production is big business. The process of growing, making, distributing, storing, cooking of food uses loads of energy, fuel and water. And this process generates 30% of the world's carbon dioxide gases um, with 90% of the UK fruits and 50% of the vegetables coming from overseas, distribution alone means that your green beans could have traveled all the way from Kenya and your grapes from Greece or even Egypt. And the huge amount of resources that goes into production of all of this food amounts to the same amount of carbon dioxide as 4.6 million flights from London to Perth. And lastly, it's, it's, it's morally wrong. Um, you know, we mentioned this in, in the slides before that 800 million people are hungry every night. That's one in nine people on the planet who are starving or malnourished. Now, each and every one of them could be sufficiently fed on less than a quarter of the food that is wasted in the USA, UK and Europe each year. And because we have a globalized food supply system, this demand for food in the West can drive up the price of food grown for export in developing countries, as well as displacing the growth of crops to feed native populations and drive accelerated degradation of natural habitats. So that's just something for you to think about when we throw away food, all of these resources, all of these things that you've actually mentioned in the chat facility and what I've mentioned right now, all of that goes to waste. So the best step we can make is actually to, is to not waste this um, food or, or, or drink um, that we buy. And it's, like I said, it's better financially, um, environmentally, and it's better for our health as well. So next what we'll have is we'll have David just talking about, um, about what's happening locally as well in terms of where the food waste goes locally. Yeah, thank you very much, Sheila. Yeah, the very, great uh, literal food for thought there. Uh, and I think um, choosing the banana, um, you know, a really, a really, a really interesting case study. And of course, we, we, we could also mention in the case of bananas, you know, that some of the production practices in terms of some of the international firms involved and things like that are uh, and the and the importance of those bananas to the economies of some uh, Caribbean countries. Any 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 of those of us who are concerned with international development, uh, you know, need to look at where we're actually getting our bananas from and and uh, under what sort of circumstances they're they're grown. But anyway, turning to what actually happens with the food waste in Hertfordshire and what we know about it. Um, well, first of all, uh, as I'm sure um, all our audience will be will be well aware, uh, most Hertfordshire councils collect uh, food waste for recycling, either um, weekly uh, collections like the um, like the, uh, the the illustrations on the top left, are sort of where many of you will be familiar with the food waste container set out once a week uh, for collection on a by a dedicated uh, food waste vehicle. Um, and that material is, is taken to uh, anaerobic digestion plants where the methane is abstracted from the decaying food matter and, uh, and uh, uh, which, which uh, in the case of the Hertfordshire anaerobic digestion plants is uh, used to generate uh, electricity for the grid on site. So um, a, a remarkable uh, transformation actually. Uh, and, the, and two of the plants produce substantial quantities of, uh, of, of electricity. Uh, and, and the process also produces a sort of fertilizing liquor, uh, which can be applied to 
uh, farmers fields. It, it, it can't yet, I don't believe, be, be uh, ad uh, adapted for, for, for home gardening use, but, uh, but it's certainly used to, uh, to fertilise local uh, farmers fields. Um, the alternative to the, to the weekly uh, food waste collection uh, is collection of food waste mixed with garden waste. Some Hertfordshire councils offer this. Uh, where this happens, the material is taken to um, an in-vessel uh, plant where it's heat treated. This is necessary because although uh, the preponderance of material in these combined collections is, is garden waste, any food waste has to be treated under uh, heat uh, conditions to, to uh, destroy harmful pathogens that cause foot and mouth and other and other uh, serious diseases in the food chain. And so you, you, if, your, if your food waste is collected mixed with your garden waste, it will go to a plant like the one on the, on the lower right in the illustration in, in an in-vessel composting plant. Next slide, please. And um, we were hearing about the food miles uh, in the journey of the banana or the, or the runner bean or, uh, but, but in the case of um, Hertfordshire's organic material, it's, uh, it's food waste and it's mixed food and garden waste, um, it's treated almost entirely in county. Uh, we have two plants in the St Albans area, uh, which, which handle respectively uh, food waste exclusively in an anaerobic digestion facility and food waste mixed with garden waste in an in-vessel composting plant. And then we also have facilities in the north of the county, an in-vessel composting facility uh, at Rushton uh, near, near Buntingford. And then in Hoddesdon, there is another anaerobic digestion plant. Um, indeed, the only organic material generated in, collected in Hertfordshire, which goes out of the county, is a, a relatively small amount of garden waste, which goes to Suffolk or to a plant literally just on the border in uh, in Enfield, um, some of the some of the garden waste collected at the recycling centres goes there. But the rest of it and the, all the food waste is processed in county. Uh, next slide, please. And where and councils that collect exclusive food waste, um, we, we 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 are able to assess uh, how effective their food waste. Uh, collections are. Um, and you can see that um, considering that food waste collections were only established four or five years ago, um, they're, 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 they're doing reasonably well. Um, all, all of them are collecting, uh, are collecting, uh, approaching half or slightly more than half. Um, Roxbourne, which has a higher preponderance of flats, I think, than uh, um, some of the other councils and where um, uh, the layout of some of the older flats complexes doesn't allow uh, the uh, dedicated bins to be provided. Um, it's perhaps a little bit less um, uh, is, is a little bit less uh, uh, has slightly less uh, capture rate of food waste than some of the others. And some of the councils are missing from this list because they have combined garden and food waste collections or have only just started their food waste collections. Uh, and either the data can't be used in the same way to get an idea of how they're performing or, or it, uh, it, it, it simply isn't comparable. Those are the five authorities that have got a, a sort of uh, uh, an established track record in, in, in dedicated food waste recycling. But uh, if we look at the next slide, we'll see that this is actually, um, uh, all, all, you know, the performance of the, of the food waste collection schemes is almost, um, almost um, a, a, an irrelevance because of the much more serious problem of um, what's actually in the waste bin. And uh, in Hertfordshire, we've recently conducted what we call waste composition analysis, which is the uh, sampling of representative numbers of uh, bins and other waste containers to assess exactly what's in them. Uh, and this exercise in Hertfordshire undertaken last autumn has demonstrated that <laughs> of the weight of the typical waste bin, um, is made up of avoidable food waste. This is not scraps, not bones, not, uh, not stalks, not skins. 
this is material, this is food, perfectly edible food, which has simply been thrown away. Much of it fruit and veg, much of it bananas, as we, but, but it also includes bread, large quantities of bread. We saw some of the, some of the uh, items in Sheila's presentation that are typically found in this, but the, but the shocking extent of it um, is, is perhaps only brought home when one actually delves into the bins. And as I say, in Hertfordshire, we have this challenging finding that um, a, a quarter of the entire bin is made up of avoidable food waste. Now you can see that the unavoidable food waste and the garden waste, uh, very small uh, proportionately in the, in the overall contents of the typical bin, but avoidable food waste, the major single item. Um, and uh, something that if we look at the next slide, um, we can see that uh, Hertfordshire is well aware that it needs to do something about. Um, and, and this sort of exercise where we encourage people to look at how they manage their food, how they manage the, the way they purchase it, how they use their leftovers, use store cupboard ingredients, as Andy was doing, um, th this is this is uh, so important because, um, as Sheila was saying, you know, there's a there's a, an environmental issue. There's almost a moral issue here. You know, we are uh, buying material and simply and simply throwing it away. Uh, and the best way to drive those food recycling percentages up even more, because they are a function of the amount in the bin. Uh, as against the amount that is abstracted for uh, recycling. The way to drive those recycling percentages up is to reduce the amount of avoidable food waste which is in the residual bin. Um, otherwise it's just expensive biofuel. So we, we want, uh, you know, our, our, our aim, um, working with farmers, working with retailers, uh, using social media, but, uh, but using any uh, a, 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 any communications mediums that are open to us. Andrew's on the same is calls, on. Is to get as wide a... Andrew's on the same calls, or our... ...a message as possible. I'm getting a bit of crosstalk here. Getting, um, it, it, it's if we can, uh, you know, really focus on trying to drive avoidable food waste out of the system. And that's, uh, we, we, we're trying to develop some campaigns uh, within the Waste Aware Partnership that the, the different authorities can share. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand back to Sheila. Thank you, David, for that. And hopefully that will give you a bit of an insight as to what's happening locally um, with your with your food waste. That's a girl, was it the mule that I made there? Oh, I'm thank on a video you. call, the girl that was at the mule. I think we we'll have to mute Sony just for a little while. He's on the video call, I'm on. The other one was a guest of... Um... Okay, I'm going to carry on. And um, forgive me, Tony, but I'm going to be talking over you. So the, the next segment is the recipe demonstration, Let's again. Um, amazing cookbook. And thank you so a lot for, for showing love for the recipe uh, recipes this that we're in the cookbook. <laughs> So we now have a pre-recorded recipe with one of our students, and Andy, and it's going to be a ratatouille, niçoise. I'm hoping that I say that correct, but I'm sure David will correct me if, if I haven't. <laughs> so if we can um, if we can move over to the VT, please, Helena. Thank you. We, we can't hear the sound. Sorry about that. Can, can anyone hear the sound? I no, can... no, we can't. But if you want to just check to see if the volume is, is, is up. Yeah, it is. Okay, go with me. Okay, so welcome to West Hearts College uh, in Watford. And, um, but today we're going to demonstrate a couple of the dishes from our Love Your Leftovers cookbook. 
Um, today I'm one of my second year chefs. Uh, this is Sidon. Hi Sidon. Um, he's going to be making a ratatouille and we're going to do it with a garnish of some black olives. So we call it ratatouille this one. So firstly Sidon has chopped up uh, half an onion and we've got a little bit of olive oil in a hot pan and he's going to be turning that over trying to start the cooking process and to um, get some colour on the vegetables. So next, um, he's got an aubergine and we're going to do some diced aubergine and that needs to go in second because that takes a reasonable long time to cook. We're also going to be using some courgettes uh, and some pepper and a little bit of garlic and um, some fresh basil and um, some tin tomatoes. The seasoning is important as well. We must make sure we, we get some nice salt and pepper in there to give it the real flavour. And we'll also be putting just a tiny little drizzle of red wine vinegar inside just to help uh, combat the sweetness of the tomatoes. So you're going to Put the, put the aubergines in now, Sidon. Yeah, so it'll take a while to cook. Give it a turnover. So all we're doing is just a roughly, roughly dicing these. And um, we don't want um, them to be spongy and soft. So that's why we put it into hot oil so that the outside of the vegetable seals, especially with the aubergines, that's important. The side has prepared some of the uh, courgettes and now a little bit of red pepper. Take the seeds out first.
So we seem to be having a little bit of trouble with the, um, the voice over here. So I'll, I'll just talk you through a little bit of this. Um, Sidon's um, he's just done the aubergines and the courgettes, put those into the hot pan with the onions. And um, he's got some uh, chopped herbs there, I think it's parsley. Um, he's going to pop some of that in and then finish finally with the peppers because the peppers, we need to be quite al dente. Um, and he is putting all that into his pan and um, we seem to have cut to the final dish there. I thought that happened there, but um, he's uh, stirring it all around, making sure it's all cooked. Um, I'm just going to add some tomatoes, a little bit more olive oil. It's getting a bit dry. The great thing about this ratatouille dish is um, if you had, if you didn't have an aubergine, but you had a bit of uh, butternut squash, you could use that instead. If you didn't have um, a pepper, you could use um, just a little bit more courgette or maybe put some spinach inside. And the other good thing about it is it's a dish that you could make 10 portions for a family of four and it could go into lunch boxes the next day. It could be regenerated the following day for, for dinner um, or even could be blitzed up to make a, a soup or, or a sauce out of. So it's a great way of using uh, bits and pieces. It doesn't have to be specific with these uh, vegetables. It can... Um, it can be quite adaptable. And as long as it's seasoned nicely, um, I think most people would find it pleasant to eat. Uh, the finishing of the black olives, um, it's just the style, the thing they do in Nice, they just uh, put some black olives in. You don't have to do that, that's just uh, a Nice way of doing it. <laughs> Sorry the pun there, but... Uh, <laughs> So this is Sidon, he's one of my level two chefs. Um, he's actually very good with his life skills and um, he's a very willing learner. Uh, he's only been in England a couple of years, but he's, uh, he's gonna go places. He's very uh, capable and he's, um, he came in today on his, uh, on his holidays to, to help us. We did some more recording this morning for some, another event. So, you know, he's, he's really uh, keen. Um, he's just going to put some basil in to finish off. Uh, the basil always works well with this dish and tomatoes. Um, so just some fresh basil to, to tear it up, put it in as leaves, or just um, run your knife through it just to shred it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So we'll go back to the presentation now. Thank you for that voiceover, um, Andy. I actually met Sidon again um, last week when I went over to the charity evening hosted by West Hearts College to raise money for the cookbook. And it was just brilliant seeing Sidon, you know, in, in the kitchen in his um, chef attire, and I agree with Andy, um, him and, and all of the students are, are, are really certainly going to places, definitely. And this is, this is something that they've created as well. You know, this is probably the first 
um, recipe that they've created in terms of for it to be published in a cookbook. So I'm really excited for their, their future as well. So now I'm going to show you ways and how you can actually be kitchen savvy and waste less food and potentially save money too. So give me a high five if you're in the club for doing that. Okay, I can't see you, but I imagine that you're actually doing it. Thank you, thank you. Don't keep me hanging. <laughs> so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some tips of how you can actually be a food waste champion. And there's just five steps, five steps of how you can save £730 a year, which is an average British family. And with that, mo with that money, you can actually, that money can go towards a super fun holiday or 25 family trips to the cinema obviously all um, COVID, re COVID um, dependent really in terms of how the pand pandemic is, um, is um, panning out. But um, nevertheless, there's a lot of fun that can be had with 730 pounds. So let's move on to the next slide. So a meal planner. N tip number one is to, is to plan your meals. Check what's in your cupboard, fridge and freezer before going shopping. You can even take photographs off your fridge and um, cupboards to stop you from spending um, your money on food items that you don't actually need. So knowing what you're going to buy before you go shopping is really important and also planning your meals in advance which will then allow you to shop for meals rather than just individual ingredients which may not end up being used. And you probably remember from yesteryears a lot of supermarkets had the the bog off you know buy one get one free. And um, we realized actually that what was happening was that there were a lot of items because what people were being quite attracted to having two of everything, but paying just for the price of one and it was getting wasted. So um, you probably noticed that offer does not exist anymore in, in the um, supermarkets that we have at the moment. Now, knowing your dates, number two. This is something that I just got asked the other day, actually. What is the difference between a best before date and a use by date? So I'm gonna really make it simple for you. Best before date refers to quality. It's your food, which will be at its best um, before the date given. After this date, it might not be at its best, but it would still be safe to eat. So you need to use your senses to make judgment on this one. So best before date refers to quality. Now use by refers to safety. So this is a food that you must not eat past its use by date. And this tends to be really for items like eggs, for example. But really best before date, just use your judgment. And just to give you an example of the banana, even potatoes. I mean, ugh, my potatoes are a bit sprouty, but you know, I just cut it off or you can actually grow the potato when it's sprouting you can you can put that in a bucket of soil and um, it can be lovely nourishing winter food for you so there's a lot of things that that that, that you can use if the the um, vegetables and fruit are kind of nearing to its um, uh, best before date items like fruit like bananas and can actually be chopped up so you can be chopped up and and, and put into the freezer and then you can um, dig them out again when you want to make a smoothie. There's a lot of things like that, that that can be done, but to know your dates. So again, best before dates, best before refers to quality and use by refers to safety. Thirdly, be savvy with your storage. What does this mean? This basically means to seal your food properly that you're planning to eat. So items such as biscuits and cereals once opened can last longer if they're stored using food clips or even placing them in an airtight container. Because if you don't, especially biscuits, they will end up being a bit bendy and the taste is not gonna be quite there. So we can um, increase the longevity by using um, bags which seals or just using containers. Freezing food that you, you know um, may not be able to eat in time, especially before the food deteriorates in quality, freeze those foods. For example, I gave the example of bananas. Um, I'm gonna give the example of cheese. Cheese is something um, I know once it goes around a bit white around the edges, people don't like to eat it or there's a bit of mold there. But before it gets to that point, um, you can either chop that off if you 
got a, if you've got a stomach full of steel um, or you can actually before it gets to that point grate it grate it and freeze it and you can whack it out from the freezer you can put it on your cheese on toast you put it in your pasta and your lasagna so it's all ready to be used for when you want to make such meals and also make sure that your fridge and freezer are actually in the right temperature so your your fridge uh, for example should be kept below five degrees and your freezer should be kept between minus 18 um, centigrade, centigrade to 25. So by keeping your fridge and your fridge freezer in, in those sort of um, temperatures, there's going to be longevity of your food. So like I said, with your fridge, if it's below five degrees, you can keep your food fresher for up to three days, three extra days. So the next, the next bit is... Um, Number four is perfect your portions. So we can waste a lot of food, especially rice and pasta, when we do not measure the right amount out for the number of people eating. So if you don't enjoy eating your leftovers, then you have to ensure that you are cooking the right amount every day. You can use a cup to measure your portions or even an empty yogurt or cream pot. It makes handy measuring tools for rice, porridge, pasta, etc. And lastly, love your leftovers. Now, like I said, this cookbook is packed with mouth-watering recipes to help you use all your fruits and vegetables and excess servings. Any leftover food can be used for a free lunch for the next day. And if you, and, or if you don't know when you're going to eat it next, just freeze it, freeze it for another day. I did that just last week. I, had, I made some curry and I knew I was gonna be away for the weekend. And so once it cooled down, I just put it in um, in a container and it's actually going to be my meal for today. So I just um, took it out of the freezer just yesterday and it's um, happy, happily being defrosted right now in, in, in the fridge. And I've got, a, I've got a free meal today, which I'm kind of excited about. So if you're unsure what to make, so for example, if you've decide to buy uh, an item of fruit or vegetables, but you don't know how to cook it, or you've got other items, but you don't know how to cook it, but there was an offer on it, and if you stop for ideas of what to make, you can actually check out this um, website. If you, if you visit lovefoodhatewaste.com forward slash recipes, and if you add in, for example, aubergine, it will then give you a list of all the wonderful recipes that you can make with that food item. It's absolutely brilliant. I've used it and I really do recommend it. So scribble away that, um, that website and I'm sure it'll come to really good use. Now for some more tips, actually. So put a lid on it. You can save on cooking time and electricity um, by boiling water more efficiently with the lid on. This will keep the water hot without having to turn up the heat and this can save about three percent in energy costs per saucepan saucepan so put a lid on it next one is use your loaf so if your fresh bread has gone a bit stale don't worry this top tip will breathe new life into your bread all you have to do is dampen your leftover uh, loaf with water pop it into hot oven for a couple of minutes and you have edible bread again and if your fresh bread has turned a bit hard and I've used this tip several times now then you follow the same steps but you wrap the bread in kitchen foil and just leave it in there for a couple of minutes three minutes or so and you can feel it when it's soft and um, whack it out oh, the butter will melt so nicely and you won't lose any teeth either it'll be soft as anything and it's a game changer for me so um, the next one we have turn over a new leaf and I do this frequently. I love my spinach and kale. So if you love your, if you love your, your bags of, um, like I said, spinach, kale or other green leafy salads, but you don't always eat every leaf on time before it starts wilting, then try out this handy hack. When you, when you buy it, transfer the greens in a tissue lined container. And trust me, it will, la it will last twice as long as if it was in the fridge if you want to sorry it would last l l twice as long in the fridge so if you want to um, use your green leaves as well as other veggies such as green beans you can use the same uh, method 
the best way to do it in terms of green beans, etc., you can you can blanch it, um, where you scald the veg in boiling water for a couple of minutes before placing it into ice water, and this halts the cooking process. And once your greens are, um, are are dried out, you can freeze them in individual portions. And again, that is a definite game changer. So the last one we have is. Um, I read up on this um, very recently, actually, it's use up day a week. And I was speaking to one of my friends and with her out, with her not even learning about this particular study, which Hellman's um, actually put together. This is Hellman's from Mayonnaise fame. They did a study back in, the, um, in, in Canada, actually, just last year. And they found they found this out. They ran them one of the longest and largest behavioral studies into household waste. And they discovered that adopting just one use up day a week um, by making a meal using ingredients already in the fridge and kitchen, you can actually reduce the amount of food thrown away by a third. So we all know that no one sets out with the tension of throwing away good food in the bin. But what happens? Life just gets in the way. Um, you know, um, you have weekends which are just uh, which are just randomly booked and you need to be away so we don't intentionally want to throw away food but it does happen like I said plans change food that was meant to be eaten on Saturday is still there sitting there on a Thursday and sometimes some people don't have the skills or the confidence to turn seemingly unrelated ingredients left in their fridge into a tasty meal so the study found that the main reasons people throw away food at home it includes because they've forgotten it. It's in the fridge, fridge or freezer at the back or in the cupboard at the back and not knowing what to do with those leftover ingredients. So what happens is that these items are normally ignored or binned. So the study actually showed that tackling this problem doesn't require people to make big, big changes to long life habits in terms of how they buy or store cooked food. It can be done with small, simple steps that involve very little skill and effort. So they created this brand called, or they developed this approach called the three plus one approach, which gives people a simple rule of thumb, which means use a base such as a bread, rice or pasta, then add in a vegetable or fruit, and then add in a protein of choice, either tofu or eggs then bring these items ingredients together and with a magic touch just add a few herbs and spices and a condiment to flavor and you have yourself a meal and so i really do recommend using using this one use up a week for my friend that spoke about it with her without her even learning or knowing about this particular report she says is worked out really well for her and it gets you to see what's actually behind uh, um, at the back of the cupboard and at the back of the fridge and freezer as well. So the next item I'd like to speak to you about is eating in season. And this is really, this is really close to my heart. Eating food which has grown closer to you is better for you and the planet. It will help you to reduce your own carbon footprint and it supports a more sustainable food economy. Um, better for the environment and local community. Like I said, it reduces the environmental damage um, done by transporting food from long distance and keeping them cold. And again, food, which is grown locally, needs fewer fertilizers and pesticides, and it lessens water, air, and, and soil pollution. And also helps support your local farmers and food markets as well. And this in itself builds resilience in the supply food chain and helps generate foods and produce local producers as well. It's also better in taste and health. Our bodies actually follow the natural growing and ripening cycles of fruit and vegetables. When, when we eat out of season, then our bodies are not receiving the timely vitamins and minerals that it needs. For example, eating citrus fruits in winter that have vitamin C protects you from colds and viruses. Uh, next time you buy a packet of blue blueberries, say in the winter time, check out where it's actually come from. Um, it's probably come from a place like Costa Rica. 
Um, so it has to be shipped. And you know, remember, we consumers are we are very powerful. Why? Because we hold the money. And so if we put our time and effort into buying those sort of foods which are for from far flung places out of season then those items are going to st still come because it's a uh, space economics of supply and demand also better for the pair seasonal food that is locally sourced is often cheaper than buying out of season that's been transported in bulk as well so lastly i'm also going to speak about um food waste apps so whenever, wherever you're located in the UK or even globally, you can help rescue perfectly good food that would otherwise be destined um, for landfill with these handy taps apps. The following are UK specific and some like Olio and Too Good To Go are global as well. And I mean, I have Too Good To Go. I'm going to also go on Olio as well. I've downloaded the app and it's brilliant because if you're unsure what to expect, Think about raw vegetables to make your own meal or hot pizzas or sweet flaky pastries. Um, the food that would otherwise have been thrown away is sold from these eateries at a fraction of the price. That's a great result. So lastly, I know some people on the chat facility have asked, been asking about the, the cookbook. The proceeds of the cookbook goes to charities such as Random Cafe, Forget Me Not, Dementia Dining, Reveille Lodge, uh, uh, in Bushy and also the Polio Foundation and Andy already mentioned that we're up for this amazing in international world cookbook Gourmand Awards as well later on in the year as well so we'll find out the good news about that but I really do recommend check the cookbook out it's got fantastic tips and like I said it will breathe life in your vegetables and fruit so thank you very much for listening. Really appreciate your participation. I'm going to now hand you over to David for the last bit, which is the Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. That was fascinating and perfectly complemented Andy's uh, demonstrations. And thanks, Andy, for stepping in when the sound on the film insert uh, didn't work as well as we'd hoped it would. Brilliant bit of uh, uh, broadcasting there. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the q and I'm just uh, bringing it onto my big screen, sorry, excuse me for a moment. And uh, I think most of the topics we've covered as we've gone along, um, can I draw to everyone's attention if they haven't looked in the chat that Helena has assiduously uh, posted links to various initiatives that might be of interest. Um, several of them actually being run by Waste Aware, our, our organisation. Um, we, we have several campaigns focusing on food waste, focusing on how to recycle the correct items. And also we have a lot of information on what happens to recycling uh, and other materials when they're collected, not just the food waste, as we showed in the demonstration, but other, other the recycling, the recycling and, the, and the ordinary waste as well. You can track the journey of the different... Uh, different um, waste items um, if uh, on the waste aware pages and Helena has posted a number of links. There's also a lot of uh, very interesting hacks, hints and tips that people have posted on various techniques for dealing with um, uh, food that would otherwise be wasted. And I think actually that, that brings us to an interesting point that probably the audience here um, are as knowledgeable as we are. People, people are, 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 are already um, activists in uh, arguing against food waste. They, they manage their food uh, effectively. Um, the, the, the biggest challenge for us, of course, is getting it wider into the, getting these messages wider into the community. And that's going to be the challenge for us in Waste Aware as we look again at our food waste work. Um, how to how to get the food management messages that uh, Sheila has been outlining and, and many of you have been uh, offering your own uh, hints and tips on the chat, how to get those messages out to a much wider audience so that we're not just speaking to ourselves. Uh, and, and that obviously involves resources. We will need to, to look at how we communicate. It's not just a matter of using social media and speaking to people who are already, we're already in touch with. It's a matter of um, you know, reaching out to people who 
who we uh, we haven't spoken to yet. And I think I think everyone here can help us with that message because um, if you can quietly proselytize for the the sort of food waste. Uh, messages that uh, you've shared with us with you know friends neighbors uh, uh, work colleagues who may not be as uh, you know knowledgeable or skilled in this area as you are and that helps us uh, helps us do the job um, but but meanwhile you know be assured that we are uh, you know we are working out ways of um, getting these messages to a much to a much wider audience and it's wonderful that we have this kind of a uh, an opportunity here um, so yes yeah, but we would like your help so so um, please share the share your knowledge um, you know with as with as many with as many people as you can um, just returning to the chat I see someone someone asked about um, how flats can be included in food waste collections well well many flats are uh, and and um, a number of local authorities actually including Broxbourne uh, do offer food waste collections at flats using using larger wheel bins usually rather than individual containers. I mean obviously there are challenges in keeping those containers uh, you know clean between usages and so it, it means that responsibility uh, must rest with residents associations or managing agents in a way that perhaps is less of a problem for individual households. Uh, and the other big challenge in terms of flats is older blocks of flats. Um, in newer blocks of flats, planning regulations now require a full uh, range of recycling containers to be provided in a dedicated accessible space. Uh, but in older blocks of flats that was not required and with fire regulations and car, car parking uh, requirements, uh, you know, it, it will be challenging to get uh, food waste and indeed in some cases other recycling collections fully established in some older box of flats. Uh, it's something that local authorities are aware of and uh, the government is aware of as well and uh, there are uh, the, 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 there is a major consultative effort ongoing at the moment about how to fund and how to ensure a much wider range of recycling uh, including food waste uh, is, uh, is delivered across the country. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the question of how to extend facilities to older flats blocks will, is, is part of that conversation. So it is something that slowly is, is happening. Um, are there any other, so the, the, really, if you haven't looked at the chat, please do so, because it, it's got fantastic, uh, fantastic hints and tips in it. And it also has all these, all these uh, links to various campaigns and initiatives, some uh, by Waste Aware, others by uh, some of the other initiatives that have been mentioned. Um, Love Food, Hate Waste, for example, which is a national campaign, again, has lots and lots of ideas and uh, information about managing food. And there are also links to the Channel 4 programme, the Pruleaf, current Pruleaf programme, which was mentioned, and also to somebody mentioned Hellman's, and Hellman's are actually the sponsors of that programme, and they're doing a campaign, I think, aimed at uh, getting people to buy more mayo to use it to liven up their leftovers. But, you know, full credit to them, it's, um, it's an interesting initiative. And, and as, as several commentators have said, we need, um, we need influencers to reach beyond uh, you know, those of us who are already, who are already committed to this um, into the much wider public to get that 25% of the bin that is avoidable food waste um, down, to, down to a much lower total. So just let me look and see if there are any other um, questions posted. Um, ah, yes, um, I'm asked to highlight a survey monkey uh, again, it's on the it's on the uh, it's on the chat. So please do look at the chat before we before we finish, and uh, please fill out this, the the survey monkey. It's the second last posting at the moment uh, that will help uh, Sussfest and ourselves understand how the event has gone and uh, help us improve the the presentation and the, the quantity and quality next time. Um, and of course, we will circulate to everybody, as Helena mentioned, a digest of all the key issues. So has anybody got anything else they would like to offer? Uh, Helena and Sh Sheila and uh, Andy, if you're still there. Yes, I see you're there. Have, is, is there anything any of you would like to add that I haven't covered? 
No, nothing from me. I think my, um, I think I'm just really hungry now. <laughs> Thanks, Dandy. And yeah, actually, I do have one more thing to add is um, please be, sh please be sure to share your, your tips, your top tips, um, anything that you do in the kitchen that's gonna, that's gonna help you stop wasting food, share it with your friends and family. If you're on social media, share those things because not always everybody thinks of it and they just go on wasting particular types of food. So more than more, more importantly, if you, if you, if you are doing something, which is helping to reduce food wastage, please share it in, in your network. That really helps to spread the word. Absolutely. Great. Well, are we, are we going to wind up then? Or if, if no one has any other, has any other points. Shall we say goodbye to everybody then, Sheila? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, <laughs> those of you who are saying post. There's several postings saying people's stomachs are rumbling. Well, that's good. We've done our job. Um, <laughs> thank you so much um, uh, for being such a great audience. Um, and uh, see you next year at Sussfest. We hope, and and possibly who knows on the road with uh, some. Uh, ways to wear presentations we're hoping to start uh, going and talking to the community again soon so anyway thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon goodbye thank you, thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.